Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today we have Charles Hugh Smith. He's an author, leading global finance blogger, and America's philosopher, we call him. He's the author of several books on our economy and society, including A Radically Beneficial World, Automation, Technology, and Creating Jobs for All, Resistance, Revolution, Liberation, A Model for Positive Change, and The Nearly Free University in the Emerging Economy. Also, Pathfinding Our Destiny, Preventing the Final Fall of Our Democratic Republic, and most recently, Will You Be Richer or Poorer? Welcome, Charles. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. It's always my pleasure. I'm, I always get... Um, Amazed at you know those long titles. I need to fi- start finding shorter book titles. <laughs> okay, sure. and uh, yeah, you're very prolific on your blog of twominds.com as one of CNBC's top alternative finance sites. So, we'd like to focus on a discussion on some of the themes that you've been writing about recently, uh, in particular, um, doing today a focus on the widening gap between the financial markets and the real world, the the real economy, if you will. Your initial thoughts? Uh, Yeah, Uh, this is a great topic, Richard, because as we all know, the NASDAQ uh, stock index has soared to, you know, all time highs um, and in direct uh, uncorrelation, if you will, with, with the real world, although there's lots of rationalizations like, well, the world's going digital, so big tech is going to win and so on. But nonetheless, um, it's, it's disconnected from the, the real world in which most people are, are, are facing the possibility of a decline in income, you know, and a decline in their general wealth, right? And, um, as things unravel, uh, and and so, and why would they be unraveling? Well, because um, the pandemic basically triggered um, or exposed a lot of the vulnerabilities that we've um, allowed to build up in our financial system. So um, the question is, what happens um, when when um, markets reconnect with the real world? And um, I, I anecdotally, it seems like. Uh, people are in in a state of uh, suspended animation or or denial about um, the impact of 21 percent plus unemployment, and uh, and and that would possibly continue or even uh, get worse. And so and how and how what happens when markets finally start absorbing this reality? Exactly. And uh, yeah, before we get into the real world, uh, the economy, what's happening there? Uh, a lot of people ask uh, why are the financial markets going through the roof and we just wanted to give some explanations on that uh, how that happens some of the mechanisms if you will um, you know from central bank uh, monetary policy and from government fiscal policy so you know you've got money printing uh, outright money printing printing money out of thin air that's happening quantitative easing in terms of the buying of assets anything from bonds, mortgages, uh, mortgage-based bonds to uh, to corporate bonds now, uh, high-yield corporate bonds the Federal Reserve is beginning to buy, and um, and also the repression of interest rates, uh, keep, keeping the interest rates low. So those mechanisms translate into uh, a, a lot of these um, mechanisms that will propel uh, asset prices higher, asset inflation, if you will. So, so if we look at the lower interest rates, for example, uh, that allows uh, some companies who look at that as an opportunity to borrow money at low interest rates and then turn right around and buy back their shares, uh, their their equities. So that would drive prices higher on the equity prices. Uh, you've also got the situation of lowering interest rates translating to lower mortgage costs uh, and then therefore rising housing prices. So there, there's that mechanism. Uh, you also have, uh, when you have lower interest rates, you have rising bond prices. So the assets of bonds 
uh, going up as well. Um, and then as asset prices go higher, uh, some people using that as collateral to, to do even more purchases or investment in, into other assets, you know, just making the whole, the whole pile even higher. Um, and, and then also there's a mechanism for banks and the financial sector to go to the central bank window, borrow at very low interest rates, uh, let's say 25 basis points, and then turning right around on the same day and buying a bond, say, for 2%, so thereby getting 1.75% free money. You know, you and I can't do that, but at, at the financial sector bank level, that, that's enabled those who are closest to the money to, to reap the benefits of all this money printing QE and, and lower interest rates. And this all ties into a theme that you've written a lot about financialization. Can you provide some additional mechanisms from, from that uh, theme? Yeah, you've, you've just uh, done a good job describing all the, the basic mechanisms used um, to uh, repress interest rates and boost uh, financial assets. I guess um, the financialization has a couple of other points that uh, kind of augment what you just described. Uh, one is that on a global scale, when, when things get financialized, you take um, assets that were once uh, safe and localized, like local home mortgages, for example, um, and then you turn them into a commodity that then can be marketed globally. So that was, of course, the, the, the root, uh, one of the root causes of the 2008 financial crisis was um, localized, what were once were once safe localized um, assets, meaning home mortgages, were juiced up into exotic, you know, um, financial instruments um, through, through subprime, you know, mechanisms, and then sold globally, right, to, um, you know, pension funds in Norway and so on, which, which had no way to understand the risk that they were buying. And so that is part of why financialization leads to a very fragile financial system is because the risk um, has been hidden as part of the, the marketing pitch, right? And, um, and a lot of times there these, um, the more exotic instruments that are sold as hedges um, are combining things like interest rates and currency uh, fluctuations, which um, are really hard to model and so on. So uh, the, my point being that if you, if you mask risk or it's hidden, then it's actually, it, it doesn't go away. It's just being transferred to the entire system. And this was partly what was, uh, what happened in the 2008 global financial crisis is the risk was hidden, but it was actually transferred to the entire global financial system. And so when the subprime uh, mortgage bubble popped, that relatively small market was, ended up being a domino that started toppling all these other dominoes. So risk um, that is not fully, um, priced or even understood. That's part of the downside of financialization. The other one is the, the incredible dependence in financialization on people having enough income to service debt. Because, you know, as we all know, debt has been rising faster than nominal growth in the economy um, for quite some time. And um, so if you're dependent on people servicing their debt, you, you really can't allow that their income to decline much because um, then you get defaults and then the bank has to take these losses and the, the banks are generally not capitalized enough to absorb more than two or 3% of their total, uh, you know, loan exposure in losses, you know? Uh, and so I, looking ahead, we can see that the, that these vulnerabilities were hidden when, um, when global growth was steady, you know, at two or 3% a year and incomes, if they were stagnant, then they were offset because interest, um, the interest due on loans declined as interest rates fell. Well, that kind of um, virtuous cycle is, has been broken by the pandemic. And now we're seeing um, fiscal authorities, right? Governments uh, stepping in and, and sending um, out cash payments and, and enhanced uh, unemployment insurance here in the U.S. to try to keep household income up high enough where they can meet their, their debt obligations. But if we look a little deeper, then we, we start realizing that it's going to be very difficult uh, for that to continue because 
we've like you and I have talked to in re- recent shows about uh, remote work and working from home is now uh, to some degree a default setting. You know, it's, it has so many favorable uh, characteristics. And so we're looking at maybe commercial office space, maybe facing 40 percent uh, vacancies forever. <laughs> or maybe more. And so, uh, and people, uh, households have been unable to meet their mortgage and rent payments. Uh, apparently a very high number, right? I've seen numbers as high as 31% here in the U.S. So people are going to start defaulting and the system is is not rigged to absorb um, very large losses. And so um, that is where the key vulnerability of financialization is, is going to come out and it's going to affect the real world as as um, lending tightens up as soon as um, as losses and defaults start occurring then banks have to tighten up lending and even if they can't raise interest rates they can simply refuse to loan to people who they consider you know a potential risk so once credit dries up the real economy is affected so um, that's kind of a convoluted way I'm trying to connect financialization with, with the real world economy. You know, they, they seem to act as two different com- separate entities, but they are connected through debt and leverage and servicing debt. Exactly. And that leads us to a focus on the real world, what's happening in the real world, the real economy. Um, I actually see an analogy with what happened in the first year in communist Cuba, 1960-ish, when there was lots of wealth, uh, you know, accumulated from the capitalist years before that. And so therefore, in the first year of communism, there was a lot of wealth that everything was not too bad, sort of where we're at now. And then progressively, as the years went by, uh, a declining standard of living, uh, you know, as it became poorer. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's a great analogy, uh, Richard. And um, you know, not to not to sort of hammer on on Cuba as as one as the only example of this kind of decay we're talking about, but to to stretch your analogy a bit more, um, people who've watched documentaries on, on on Cuba as it is now know that many of the the buildings that were um, constructed there in the fifties have not been properly maintained, and so. Um, entire floors will just collapse, <laughs> right? Because there's, uh, they haven't been maintained because that's, um, that's part of what gets dropped away as your standard of living declines. You stop maintaining things and you stop rebuilding your infrastructure. So uh, you have buildings that just sort of spontaneously collapse uh, from, from lack of maintenance. And so that's, that's a good analogy for what happens when financialization runs out of rope. In other words, when you can't find anybody else to borrow more money and spend that or, or leverage that borrowed money into buying some asset at a higher price, then, then um, the whole system starts unraveling much like a building that's never been maintained, you know? And so then, and you, and you get sudden collapses. And um, that's part of what I anticipate as, as defaults start, tipping over dominoes you know there's going to be collapses of of banks and uh financial uh sort of arrangements right um you also mentioned another great analogy which was you know the tides you know for the last you could argue 75 years from post-world war ii um you know the global economies had a rising tide of of assets uh, going up and incomes tend to go up and poverty uh, diminishes and standard of living goes up and the amount of energy available to consume goes up and all of those are in danger of reversing. And in other words, an ebb tide, uh, uh, the tide is receding. And um, before we started recording, you mentioned the, the, the impact of small businesses closing. And I think that's a good introduction to this idea of, of a receding tide. Yeah. Cause a lot of people are thinking we're going to get this V shaped recovery, but things only look like they're going to get worse and we'll, we'll go into some of the, of those uh, trends that are happening. But yeah, I mean, a a rising tide raises all boats, but it it goes in the opposite way as well. So how can the professional, technical, remote working class stay viable in an economy where there's so much unemployment, uh, like in the cities for where where there was uh, lots of jobs around restaurants, gyms, 
uh, hotel industry, hotels, uh, tourism, and you know, you, you, so you think eventually at some point it's going to affect the the entire job market. Yeah, and um, I, I uh, supplied you with a uh, chart from Wolf Richter um, of the unemployment rate in the U.S. And it's a good example of how people can be misled by statistics and whether it was intended or not. Uh, we can argue about that. But the, the fact is that um, many agencies, uh, government agencies in the U.S. Are, are claiming that unemployment in the U.S. is around you know, 12 or 13 percent. But that's like not really true. What they're doing is they're taking the unemployed um, at the state level, the, the workers who uh, qualify for state unemployment, and leaving out um, millions of other uh, workers, contract workers and gig economy workers who qualify for federal unemployment. And so if you add those two numbers up, you get 32 million people are currently drawing unemployment in the U.S. And the workforce is around 150 million. So that's an unemployment rate of 21 percent, not 13 percent. So um, that is it. That's the highest it's been since the Great Depression of the you know 30s. And my other concern is I, I, there's a lot of people who have let, been left out of that equation. For instance, these small business owners that we're discussing, um, who uh, many of them are anecdotally, there's evidence that they were hoping to open on a V-shaped recovery. The V-shaped recovery is not happening. It's, it's simply not happening. So therefore, many small businesses that that uh, we're hoping to reopen, they tried reopening and they're realizing that they can't make it. And so they're closing now for good. And so uh, some of those uh, small business owners may have paid themselves as employees. And so they have, they've paid the unemployment insurance and they can basically get on unemployment like uh, their other workers. But a lot of them may be sole proprietors or that kind of thing where it's, it's, uh, they may be kind of like lost in the cracks between of these various unemployment systems. And so there, the, I suspect that the number of people who were earning an income a year ago and are not earning an income or that have suffered a huge decline in their income, I think that's much larger than the 32 million that, um, that the statistic, uh, the chart says. So I guess my thought is what kind of economy do you have with like endemic unemployment at 20 to 25%? And I think that's what people are in denial about. And I, I don't think it's just in the U.S. I mean, I'm, uh, you've probably, Richard, you've probably seen anecdotal evidence, too, where these uh, European tourist uh, cities that are super dependent on tourism are, you know, the vacancy rates 80 percent. I mean, only 20 percent uh, occupancy rate in the hotels in Barcelona and islands like Mallorca, like basically empty. <laughs> and so obviously uh, the unemployment around the world is, a, is, is, is substantial and, and could very well increase, as, as we're saying, if the, once it's understood the V-shaped recovery globally was, a, was an illusion. Exactly, and this is only after the first wave. So we have this health crisis that has morphed into a, a financial economic crisis, and economist David Rosenberg estimates that this crisis is about 10 times worse than the financial economic crisis of 2008, so that gives some magnitude. Uh, so we have this situation after only the first wave, and uh, there's an interesting article uh, that you pointed out by Dr. Jack Rasmus entitled, What Lies Ahead? And he makes a number of points that are very interesting um, in, in different areas. So let's let's go through that uh, because it, it does highlight some of the uh, the trends that are that are coming. The, the first one he mentions is a second wave of permanent job losses. Um, and he highlights actually the likelihood of significant layoffs in the public sector um, as states, municipalities, cities facing massive budget deficits are forced to lay off several millions uh, of the roughly 20, 22 million public sector workers, for example, in the U.S. Your thoughts? Yeah, that um, I, I think that that's uh, an excellent example of what you might call like second order effects, right? Like the 
the first order effect of, of the pandemic was businesses were closed. And so, of course, there was going to be layoffs of those businesses that were closed. But the, the, the fact that those businesses paid taxes and now the tax uh, revenues are, are declining rapidly and with without really uh, any hope of recovery to 2019 levels, then all these local government agencies have to, you know, have to respond to that huge decline in tax revenues. And now the federal government is, has, uh, in the U.S. has ponied up a lot of, of money um, in the initially, but there's some reluctance, um, I think, uh, to, to make those, those huge payments to the local governments permanent. So that's the mechanism that, that the article is mentioning, that eventually you have to live within your means if you're a local government, you know, that you can borrow money through bonds, municipal bonds for infrastructure uh, work, but you can't uh, pay your employees and, and your uh, make your pension plan contributions with, with borrowed money. And so, and then of course, then like we're talking about the tide receding, you know, uh, local cities and, and counties are, are facing a huge decline in tax revenues from private sector employment. And then now they're going to be laying off or, uh, people or not hiring, you know, as people retire, then their workforce will shrink and they'll be collecting less taxes off their own workers as well. And then you've got the situation of rent evictions as part of the unfolding crisis in the housing or real estate rental market. Um, at the peak in April, it is estimated that roughly one third of the 110 million renters in the U.S. economy had stopped making rent payments due to the COVID shutdown. And so now is, there's a potential of as many as 23 million rent evictions projected coming in. In the in the in the next few months here, your thoughts? Yeah, right. And uh, you know, uh, Richard, it, it brings up another point that um, is worth focusing a little bit on, which is um, the high, very high cost of living. Right. That um, you know, the official inflation numbers, like we've talked about, when you look at the Chapwood index or other measures, then, you know, it's, it's not one or 2%, like we've been told for decades, it's actually much higher. If you allot a, um, a realistic percentage to housing, healthcare, childcare, you know, and so um, this statistic has been kind of gamed. And so uh, what's been hidden, I think, to, to a large degree is the, is the in extraordinary increase in rents especially in urban America, you know, the big job magnet city, Seattle, Denver, Portland, San Francisco area, you know, greater New York City, rents have, have skyrocketed. And yet, you know, wages have not kept pace. And so uh, it's not uncommon to have, you know, rents of $2,000, $3,000, even more. And uh, it's just not affordable except to the top, you know, 10% of the workforce. And so people have been stretched to the limit to try to, you know, to stay in the city where they have access to, you know, uh, more culture, higher paying jobs and so on. But so there's a, there's a lot of vulnerability because rents have, have soared. And this goes back to financialization because when um, investors who can borrow money very cheaply you know, uh, because they're, you know, closest to the money spigot. Um, you know, we call that the uh, Cantillon uh, effect, right? Um, then they've bid up uh, the, the prices, the valuations of, of commercial properties and, and rental housing. And so, if you if you buy a house for three hundred thousand that that was once one hundred and fifty thousand, <laughs> you know, because you can get the money so cheap that it still works out for you on a monthly basis, you're still going to want to raise the rents in order to make money on, on your, um, your much larger capital that you've put into the property. So there's this financialization feeds this, this mechanism of clicking rents and other expenses higher and higher and higher because the valuations have gone up so much that, well, you know, to earn a decent return, I've got to like get 40% more rent. And so, uh, the vulnerability of of, of um, lower middle class households to to uh, these these higher rents is, is I think underappreciated. So you've got sky high rents, you've got um, unemployment or hours cut, and um, people are looking at well what what do I not pay? 
And so they want to keep their car because they need that for work. So they'll make their car payment. They need the utilities. They got that. They need their cell phones. What's left? Well, I just won't, I can only pay partial rent. And the other side of this story is, you know, so many people don't have any savings because of these, uh, these mechanisms we're talking about where prices and costs keep soaring, but wages have stagnated. So people really can't afford the rent. And so it's not like they're, um, you know, taking a vacation to Vegas with, with the rent that they didn't pay. It's like, they just, just don't have the money because their incomes were, were so, um, close to the waterline, if you will, right? They were just barely keeping their head above water. And so um, hours have been cut, bonuses have been cut, um, you know, shifts have been cut. So even if people have a job, their income might have been, uh, might have taken a significant hit. So on the landlord side, how do you, what do you expect to do by chasing people with no money? And um, those of you um, like me who've been into small court, small claim court or, or that kind of thing, you, you know, it's, it's not some sort of guaranteed process, even if you get a judgment against somebody, which is in itself a laborious process. Uh, if you have to know where they're, they're banking and they have to have enough money for you to get your judgment. <laughs> so uh, you, the old saying is you can't get blood out of a stone. And um, I think that, that landlords are probably underestimating just how little money their, their tenants who have fallen behind have. Yeah, exactly. Then you've got the situation in, in child care and education, total chaos in the K through 12 public education system is happening as the school districts plan to introduce this remote learning on a major scale. Um, it's a combination of legal risks and a concern about the health as well from COVID infection. Um, the heart of the crisis is that tens of millions of U.S. working class families are dependent on two paychecks to survive economically. So they, they can't really afford to accommodate the, the school district practices that are, they're being asked to do in terms of remote learning, uh, especially for, for young children in the K through sixth grade levels, right, in terms of uh, their attention span and ability to learn from online systems. Um, I mean, basically, if even if such families could afford to pay for the expensive child care, the current U.S. child care system is far from being able to accommodate them. Uh, you've got lack of computers, networking equipment, uh, and then just um, the whole issue of, of school district fears of, fears of liability actions by parents if children become ill, significant cost of ensuring disinfected classrooms, you know, how, how that happens and the cost of doing that. Uh, the lack of classroom space to allow distance, adequate distance, two meters, you know, to, for, for learning on site. Um, and then just overall, the growing concern of teachers regarding their own exposure to, to the infection. Your thoughts? Yeah, Richard, and um, you um, you reminded me that you'd uh, laid out or already discussed. Uh, I don't know if we recorded that discussion or whether that was just you know after our session, but yeah, you had laid out a scenario where parents self-organize and um, they hire, they group together maybe a half dozen households, and then they hire a private tutor, and then. Their children are homeschooled, but in a semi-professional setting where there's, they're, they're, they're gathered together where they can, in a small group, so they can practice social distancing and they have a professional or semi-professional tutor to help them, even if they're with their remote work. And, um, and, and this is now becoming a major trend in California and elsewhere, uh, but especially in California, so far as I can tell, based from reports of my friends and so on. So um, it, it goes to show it's very interesting on multiple levels because, you know, you can't really, um, I, I don't think we can identify a perfect solution to these, these, all these issues as, as you described, right? There isn't any like one thing that's going to fix all these issues. It's very complicated and there isn't going to be a right answer. And so the institutions may not be adaptable just because of their, their core structure and their, their core sort of hierarchy and so on, that they, they may be doing the best they can, but they'll never be able to replace um, what could be done with self-organizing parents. 
you know, and um, because that's probably a better solution is is a sort of radical decentralization. Um, it's a small enough units where you're not at risk of, of, of spreading the virus because you're simply having groups of less than 10 people, right? Mm -hmm. As students. So, um, it goes to show the limits of our institutions is one thing. The other thing that, that I think a lot of people are concerned about is the, um, the lower income households don't have, as you mentioned, the resources to hire tutors. They may not have extra laptops for their children or any laptops at all. Um, and so there's a, a, a potential for a rising, uh, widening gap here in, in um, it, it sort of simulates or, or tracks the gap we're seeing in, in wealth, you know, and income inequality, right? And this has severe social consequences when, um, you know, the gap widens to the point where the, the rich are taking care of themselves and everyone else suffers, you know, uh, a decline in their standard of living, and in this case, a decline in the, the quality of their children's education. And to your point about the two-earner household, you know, in a sort of corporate hierarchical, you know, economy like we have, most people go to work at a, you know, a one location, and um, not everybody can work from home. And even if you can work from home, um, you can't really do your work if, if your kids are demanding attention because they're lost in their remote learning, right? And so uh, the schools function for, as childcare, perhaps just as much uh, as, in, as uh, an education. So if that's been destroyed now that you, you can't count on, on childcare, uh, then as you said, the replacement is just is too expensive for, for most households to afford. And so there's no easy solution. Mm -hmm. This is likely to create massive tension in municipality budgets and property taxes that cover public education costs. If you can see the, uh, the trend that as the local communities go to a private tutoring model, not needing the public school system, right? If, if that is the trend, there's likely to be rising tension for reducing uh, you know, property uh, taxes, mi municipality budgets at a time that they probably want to increase them. Like recently, uh, because Nashville raised property taxes by 32% because of, you know, falls in revenues of what's happening on COVID. Right. Absolutely. And, um, you know, Richard, there's another, um, again, from if we, you know, take a, take a longer view, you know, worker mo mobility has been a key uh, driver of corporate profits and productivity, right? Is you just relentlessly move people around uh, to meet to meet your the employer's needs. But um, what about family? You know, and so in the old kind of traditional setting, where people uh, still you know were connected, their their grandparents might be close by, and so then you'd have family who could kind of step into the breach and help with things like childcare or tutoring. And um, very few people, I would say. I don't, I don't know the actual, actual number, but a great many households don't have any family nearby. And so they're really on their own or they're trying to rely on their friends and, and their friends have their own, the same situation. So um, I, I think as a social order, we're really poorly placed um, to deal with, with education and childcare, these, these crises that we're talking about, partly because there's, those buffers have been lost you know, the buffer of grandparents nearby or aunts and uncles, that kind of thing. Um, and, and those some people who do have a family, uh, extended family within uh, easy reach, um, they're much m m better uh, able to adapt to this circumstance because there's more adults to, to help and to care, right? So um, it's another example of like a second order effect you know you you mobilize your audience you know your whole working population to maximize corporate profits and and uh essentially and then you've stripped away the the buffers the social buffers and and sort of social capital of of having extended family nearby another point that dr rasmus mentions in his article is uh, sovereign debt defaults as another trend, uh, especially due to massive debt in the public sector happening now to, to finance all, all of this coverage. 
um, you know, leading to rising credit risk in the bond markets, essentially. So that that's another big trend. Your thoughts? Yeah. Well, actually, you might be better placed uh, than I am to 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 discuss that. What I mean, obviously, uh, as everybody uh, assumes, right? Countries that can print their own currency um, <laughs> uh, can't technically can default, but but uh, their currency can. Uh, can lose uh, purchasing power, and so um, that, that's that's the other alternative: is is, is currency uh, nations could have their sovereign debt explode, and and uh, if they're not defaulting, but it's just that their currency is is losing purchasing power. So there's sort of a two paths there: one, with countries that can't print endless amounts of money and have it retain their value, then they might actually be forced to default, and then nations that can print their own money uh, might. Uh, not default, but they might destroy the purchasing power of their currency. What do you What do you think about um, that kind of scenario? Yeah, e- even even uh, somewhere in between those two extreme scenarios is is likely, in the sense that uh, not only could the the uh, currency have its purchasing power reduced, but also a rise in a stagflationary environment whereby uh, you have rising inflation um, you know as as demand comes back uh, somewhat um, and then you have a situation where uh, there's 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 demand coming back but supply is still problematic you might have supply chain disruptions all of this causing stagflationary environment rising inflation and declining economic activity or, or stagnant economic activity so so the, this could actually uh, be used to reduce the burden of the debt and the sovereign debt uh, bond markets by governments uh, as a tool of financial repression, right, is to increase the rate of inflation over a long period of time to reduce the burden of debt. Right. And um, that's what a lot of people are counting on. But um, history, even as recently as the 1970s, which was the last uh, period of sort of global st- stagflation, um, it turns out that that things like the loss of purchasing power can become nonlinear. You know, that they, they, yeah. they, uh, you, they can um, escape the control of central banks as people lose confidence in institutions and in the currency's values. So uh, that, that's another concern is, is um, we like to think that central banks are omniscient. You know, they have godlike powers, but um, I, I think that's that's exaggerating uh, <laughs> yeah, their exactly. power. Yeah. And yeah, and of course, what you what we're talking about when we're talking about default is is an extraordinary rise in debt without an without a corresponding rise in the income needed to service that debt. And that, of course, is true of households, enterprises, and governments, right? Because governments can't print. They can print money, but they can't print actual income, uh, you know, from uh, tax revenues and so on. So, mm-hmm. and this all leads to a declining standard of living because you've, got, if you have a situation of steady or fixed salaries compensation in a rising inflation environment, it just it just becomes more and more expensive to buy the basic necessities. Yeah, absolutely, Richard. And you know, when we talk about debt. We know that you know mortgage rates have dropped um, to new lows, but that's not the case for student loans, auto loans, or credit cards. So there's a tremendous amount of debt in, in the household and corporate sectors that is not dropping because there's risk involved or uh, or they're fixed, right? So as you say, um, expenses can rise, incomes can drop, but debt payments are 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 for sure. <laughs> They don't go away. You know, they might decline. They, you know, they they might not. Um, but um, what what we can expect is it's going to be more and more difficult to roll over debt if if um, if if credit becomes tighter. And we're already seeing anecdotally. Uh, I'm I'm having readers send me uh, notices from their bank that their credit line on their credit card, which was excessive, you know, like say thirty thousand, it's been cut to ten thousand. Or twelve thousand. In other words, the banks are already radically reducing their exposure to uh, overborrowing or or uh, 
you know, um, credit lines being drawn by, by people who are now marginal. So uh, that's a bad combination, right? You, you've got stagflation, you've got, you know, enormous uh, debt being acquired by governments and so on. And yet you're also seeing incomes uh, decline and credit, tighten, st- uh, credit standards tightening. Yeah, and another trend that, that factors into this in terms of less wage income and even less consumption that uh, Dr. Rasmus mentions in his article is permanent industry transformations. Uh, and he quotes from a, of a 2017 report uh, by McKinsey, the business consulting firm, that predicts no less than 30% of all workers' occupations will be severely impacted by artificial intelligence, robotics process automation, by the end of the present decade. So 30% of jobs will either disappear or have their hours reduced significantly. Right, Richard. And, and you and I, we've, um, in previous programs, just, just this year, we've been talking about... Um, the impact of remote work, uh, because once you're working remotely in a developed world uh, country like the U.S., well, then the employer realizes that they could um, have that work done anywhere on the planet with a decent internet connection, and for maybe much less than your salary. <laughs> so, uh, I, on top of automation, there's also that that potential to globalize work that was previously considered, you know. Uh, localized right so yeah and um you know there's quite a bit of talk recently about either the third industrial revolution or if you count it the fourth industrial revolution i tend to think it's more like the fourth (laughs) but um as as the pressure on enterprises to cut expenses right to keep some kind of profit margin that's that's really ramping up so um that trend that you just described is, is probably, uh, there's a lot of reason to believe it's going to accelerate, right? Because the incentives to trim labor costs are, 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 are increasing, you know? And so anything you could automate um, offshore or uh, use uh, AI algorithms to, to handle, then um, the sooner you do it, the more likely that you, uh, the quicker you'll cut costs and, and, and maintain your profit margin. And there's other points that Dr. Rasmus makes as well, uh, as far as the trend of what he sees lying ahead, and that is the return of fiscal austerity, financial instability, and political instability. Those those are very big. Your thoughts on those? Right, right. And um, I, I think that th- that really impressed me. That th- those um, all the the, the instabilities. Um, Again, I trace it back to the fact that our system lacks buffers. It's been, uh, it's highly fragile, you know, due to its dependence on debt mm-hmm. and um, leverage. Um, and then the, the problem of income for the bottom 90% has been stagnating while the, the cost of living has been soaring and the gap between those, uh, the stagnant income and the, the higher costs have been filled by borrowing. And so, um, as, as all those uh, dominoes fall or that, 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 that nexus of systems unravels, well then uh, how are people gonna uh, support the lifestyle that they've become accustomed to? And if they can't, then they're gonna be politically and socially, uh, you know, uh, well, I, dissatisfied. And they're gonna express that dissatisfaction <laughs> politically and possibly socially. So. Um, and then that, that would then pressure, um, solutions because if you can't find any unity, um, and there's no, uh, sort of compromises available, then, then you run out of, of political solutions. And, um, then, then that increases the odds of, of social disorder. So it's quite, uh, Perish, but we we do like to to end on a positive note, and we we would like to emphasize that there are some some good spots, some bullish sectors, uh, go, some good that is coming out of this, and some ideas, suggestions for uh, for either areas to invest in or or for for jobs uh, in the economy, 
And the, the theme is overall uh, like the homebody economy, as David Rosenberg mentions, as, as he calls it. Um, and so there's several areas that we can identify uh, that form a positive note. Your, your, your thoughts on this? Yeah, Richard, I think we talked a little bit about the homebody uh, economy last time. And I'm anecdotally, I'm hearing uh, contractors and architects telling me they're very busy uh, as people realize it, it's a, a solid investment. They're going to get a good return, not necessarily financially, but, you know, they're spending so much time at home and maybe they're anticipating working at home more or less permanently. So put some money in upgrading their, their home. And as you said, there's a lot of services um, that deliver to the home that, that now look really attractive. Um, and uh, we talked about education. So it, it looks like there could be a, a, a very large demand for tutors, you know, people who um, may or may not have a teaching credential, but who have some experience in teaching or curriculum development. And, um, and there could be, um, I could see a lot of growth for services to this education sector uh, that would be, we would call it more like the informal education sector, right? Like maybe developing curriculum for these homeschooling um, tutors as opposed to curriculum for a school district. And you could say, well, what's the difference? And it's like, well, if, once you start involving, you know, things like remote learning and um, I think that you could see the, the growth opportunities for, for curriculum that people could um, copy or, or use and um, amend or modify for their own you know, uses. So that kind of decentralized services looks, looks positive. And another quick comment is just, you know, a lot of uh, businesses are closing because the model that they used is just no longer viable, but the, the person, um, the small business owner is, is an entrepreneurial by nature. And so they're going to be looking around um, for some other opportunity. And so uh, I think that that all the small businesses that are closing, it's not necessarily um, the end of the road for the people um, that ran those businesses because they, they're sort of trained to be entrepreneurial. They're entrepreneurial by nature or they wouldn't even have a small business. So they, they're, they're like a pool of talent that will be looking around for opportunities. And I think that's a positive. It may be difficult to invest in that, but it's something that we can be hopeful as a sort of social, you know, um, economic resource that uh, the entrepreneurial spirit there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, small businesses uh, quicker and able to be able to think outside the box for new industries, uh, new innovation, new, new types of services, definitely. So we mentioned the private tutoring type of service. Um, there's also the, the sectors of telecom, you know, how you need uh, connectivity at home, utilities, of different capacities, utilities not only in electricity, but in online business platforms, delivery services that have to do uh, also, for example, with food uh, distribution, uh, food stores as well, home, home improvement uh, type of companies, rural supply stores as well, and, and more complex uh, remote working artificial intelligence related work, uh, digitalization economy, uh, lots of like IT development in those areas, uh, implementing process enhancement improvements uh, into robotics process automations that all still requires uh, high skills in the IT sector. And uh, yeah, so basically uh, the theme would be thinking outside the box uh, in, in the, the new homebody economy. Right. And, and uh, all those same things you just uh, described, many of them can be transferred over to like healthcare. You know, in other words, just as, as education was like a, a very hierarchical, uh, rigid uh, system that was just sort of begging for uh, disruption. <laughs> the same can be said of healthcare. And so there's a lot of, you know, telecare kind of uh, things that are arising. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to strip away a lot of the cost and friction in these, in these huge sort of sclerotic centralized systems, which are now under pressure. And so that's, that's where opportunities for innovation occur, right? Wow. Great uh, discussion here on an insight into what lies ahead. How can our 
listeners learn more about your work, Charles? Yeah, please visit me at uptominds.com. Free samples of all my books and archives are all free. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk. Thank you.